goodness, there's a lot of people here tonight. I wasn't expecting this kind of a crowd, but um, thank you for all for coming. Um, I just want to make one correction um, because my husband's sitting here. My husband and I moved here in 2011. My parents had been here since 1970, and um, so we actually moved into their house. But anyway, um, I'm very excited tonight to tell you about um, the archives that are online now, the Fairhope Single Tax Historic uh, Collection. And I want to just, I'm going to just go through what's in the collection, kind of just kind of touch on some of the kinds of things that are in the collection very briefly to try to pique your interest and hopefully find something um, that you'll be interested in. It's a very diverse collection with all sorts of things in it. And then Catherine will go um, to, s to speak at greater length about how to access the, the website and how to navigate around on it. And also, I think we'll read some of the letters that she found to be most poignant and interesting. And, um, so very quickly. Um, and I also, I want to thank Tamara Dean, who's here tonight, the, um, the library director. We actually, uh, the archive committee actually worked at a desk upstairs on the second floor here in the library cataloging, thanks to the, the Fairhope Public Library and their generosity. So uh, thanks, Tamara, for coming tonight, and thanks for that. Um, <clears throat> and just as an aside, as long as we're in a library, um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about how influential books have been on the single taxers, the people who um, who started our town. And um, so you'll notice me mentioning, you'll notice a few books mentioned along the way, many of them out of print, but um, worth mentioning anyway. Uh, one, one such book um, was a very interesting book called Looking Backward, um, but written by Edward Bellamy way back in 1888. And it's a very interesting book. Um, it was a uh, utopian science fiction novel. Um, and the protagonist in the book um, goes to sleep in 1887 in a world that's, uh, there's all kinds of problems, poverty, inequality. And he wakes up in the year 2000 and everything is perfect. Everybody's happy and well cared for. Everybody has a job that they enjoy. and. Everybody has a long period of retirement in which they do things that interest them. And it's a very interesting book. It even foresees things like Amazon.com and shopping malls. And I recommend it to everybody. But um, it inspired a lot of people, and it, and it um, generated a lot of conversation about how to make the world better. And, um, and Edward Bellamy clubs sprang up all over the country. And um, one of the people that it inspired was E.B. Gaston here, who um, is credited with basically founding uh, the Fairhope Single Tax Corporation. And um, he was so inspired by the book that he wanted to start a utopian community in which um, the principles of Bellamy would be um, implemented. Um, and so he, in 1890, four years prior to starting the Fairhope Single Tax Corporation, or um, he tried to start a community called the National Cooperative Company. And he um, wrote a prospectus, and he wrote uh, bills of articles, the Constitution, et cetera. And he found a location to, for it in southwest Louisiana. And um, so we have many, many, many letters in our collection from people to E.B. Gaston um, who are very interested in um, starting a Bellamy's army, as they call it, or things like that. And um, they um, write to him. They, there was a great deal of poverty at that time. A lot of them write letters about how they would really want to join, but they just can't scrape together the $5 to join. And, and some of them are really just heart-wrenching letters. And they were very interesting to read. Um, so um, his he was never able to get his. Uh, community off the ground, but there were other um, uh, other utopian communities that did get started, and um, one one that was really based uh, they called it a Bellamy community was Kawia Cooperative Company in in uh, California, started in uh, 1886. I'm not sure that's correct, but in any case, um, they started a, a, a colony out there. Um, it was based on the, it was a, they they based it on the logging industry. There was going to be equal work and pay for both women and men. 
Um, they cut down sequoia trees and um, and I, I, they had a brief period of success with that. But um, there were other colonies, and one who, that had um, really cr close ties to Fairhope was Topolo Bompo Bay Colony, which was in Mexico. Um, it was similar to Fairhope in that it had a harbor and that they built a wharf and they built um, they had bay steamships, they bought a, built a warehouse, and um, the founder had a vision of integral cooperation, which was something E.B. Gaston also had, where colonists would build and operate and own their own railroads and banks and water supply, and all members would be equals and, and share equal stakes in running the town. Um, another uh, interesting one, um, and some of the people that lived at Topolobampo when it folded moved to Fairhope, which had gotten started by that time. Um, another one that um, where people moved here from was the Ruskin Colony, which was in Tennessee. We have some very interesting letters from the Rus from people that were in the Ruskin Colony describing its ending and um, fascinating letters about how they split it all up and where everybody was going. And some of them did come here to Fair Oak, and you can read the other ones, but. Um, and another book written around that time, which um, to me is as a, not as a pretty boring read. Sorry, Mac McCauley, but um, unlike uh, Looking Backwards, which was fascinating and a fun read, Progress in Poverty is almost impossible to get through for me. But it it was a bestseller, believe it or not, in its day, and um, um, again, it generated a lot of conversation about how to. Um, about the, as it says right there on the cover, the cause of the increase of want with the increase of wealth, and how, and basically the remedy for that. And um, single tax or Georgism became very popular, and single tax clubs uh, sprang up all over the country. In 1890, there were 131 of them in the United States, one of them um, being in Des Moines, Iowa. Now, in 1892, uh, Des Moines, Iowa was a hotbed of political activity, and y you can find a lot about politics in our archives. There's things about the Grange, which was a farmer's group. Um, there are things about the National Greenback Party. Um, but um, um, in 1892, um, they had just formed out of the People's Party, the Populist Party, and General James Baird Weaver, who was a member of the Des Moines Single Tax Club, um, was a presidential candidate in that year. Um, on the left, that is my great grandfather, Thomas E. Mann, and he was a he was a congressional candidate. Um, did I? General Weaver was a presidential candidate. I, I think I said that. But it, um, in any case, you can see here a picture in the center. Um, the populists were. Um, concerned with um, the monopoly power that the railroads had um, and unfair labor, labor policies. And you can see here in the middle, um, basically that's monopoly or the railroad um, kind of killing off labor there on the horse. So that's what that depicts. Um, but unfortunately, uh, General Weaver lost that election. Um, and so E.B. Gaston, who had worked very hard on that campaign for General Weaver, disappointed and despondent, tried again. He was determined to, to form a colony and, and try to experiment with single taxation and, and have a town where he could prove that, that he could make the world better by implementing those things. Um, and um, he, he he wrote a paper called True Integral Cooperate. Is that right, Catherine? True, True, True Cooperative. Cooperative. True Cooperative Individualism. And he uh, gathered together a lot of the people who had been active in, in General Weaver's campaign, and they basically formed the Fairhope Industrial Association. Um, there were 12 officers of that, and um, my great-great-grandfather was one of them, and as was my uh, great-grandfather, who's right, who's pictured right there. But in any case, um, um, membership applications started right away, and in May of um, 1894, um, 
my great grandfather and two of his brothers there, and my my uh, great great grandfather were early members. And um, this is a letter they received from E.B. Gaston, um, which basically said, uh, "We have now enrolled 21 active paying members here, and more pro pro positively promised, and are feeling encouraged." There can be no doubt whatsoever that our establishing our colony with a good, strong membership this fall. And so, with that, um, they, de they decided they needed to um, find a location to, to start this community off. And um, they had a search committee of two. My great-great-grandfather, Shua Mann, was one of them. James Blanche, the other. And... Um, I like seeing Wayne here because he played uh, Shua Man in the, the colony play that Donnie and the History Museum put on in the seminar. So there he is out there. Um, in any case, they went to Arkansas. Um, they went to Texas. They went to Louisiana, uh, Alabama, and Tennessee. And the, the, our collection has all the letters that they wrote back to E.B. Gaston from. Um, they, they took the train, and then they get a stagecoach, and go out into the countryside and then they come back and um, the letters are really interesting. They talk about the mosquitoes and uh, all, they went in June and July. So, um, and um, they talk about that. And one interesting thing I came across was um, in Texas, they, they uh, Shua had received a letter from a guy, uh, Worcester, whose son, Alf Worcester, was one of the 12 officers of the Fairhope Industrial Association and he had moved to, um, what's now Baystown, uh, Texas, and he was urging them to come down and check out this site down in Texas. Um, but what tickled me was uh, the main, um, the road in that town was General, General Weaver Boulevard. So anyway, so um, anyway, so as you know, they um, decided that the most beautiful location of all these that they saw was right here where we are now in Fairhope, Alabama. and. Um, so the first colonists uh, took the train down. Uh, they, the, uh, the Gastons and the Hunnels started in Des Moines, Iowa. Um, they were joined by, uh, let's see, the Delgrens and the Tuvisons and C.L. Coleman from Minnesota, the Polays from Vancouver, British Columbia, and the Powers from Pennsylvania, and the Smiths from Ohio and they all arrived here in November of 1894 at Battles Wharf and um, basically lived in tents until they were able to establish a colony here by land, et cetera. Um, there's the names of the, the, the first people that uh, came on that trip. And the first thing they did was um, build a well. You can see that the well there on the left that's, um, that's right at the corner of section and um, Fairhope Avenue where, is where that, and people come and get, get their water out of that well. And we have meeting minutes every day about that well and how, dark, how many feet down they got each day. And um, C.L. Coleman was kind of the, in charge of that project. And um, it's, it's fun to read, if you're interested, the, those uh, meeting minutes are interesting to read about those first days here. And then, and that was uh, completed in, I think, 1895. Um, and then also built the wharf. That's the first wharf, which blew down, um, and I believe was kind of to the right of where the existing wharf is now. Is that correct? I think it's where the manure wharf ended up. But, but anyway, we ended up with many wharfs uh, over the years, and, the, um, and that was built in by May of 1896. So pretty fast work. Um, Eventually, um, just as an aside, uh, C.L. Coleman became disenchanted with the, the colony and kind of, he bought a bunch of land which he refused to uh, make a part of the, the colony land and um, that's what we, what's called, what's Ingleside today. But in addition to that, he wrote a novel um, which he self-published in 1930 called Educated Fools. Um, which he called a narrative of sociological adventure. And he published it in, in uh, 1930. I'm just telling you about this. We don't have a copy of it. I wish we did. Um, well, I, I actually do have a copy, but we don't, it's not part of our, our archive collection. But um, he used 
pseudonyms or, or he didn't use anybody's real name. So he tells the story of the building of Fairhope, but um, um, if you read all of the archive uh, collection and then the book, you might be able to match up who's who, but uh, I wasn't able to. Uh, so those are interesting things to read. Um, there's all kinds of things about the Fairhope Colony, the starting at the airport, a lot about the ballpark, believe it or not, all about the bay bo boats. Um, there was an organization called the Baldwin County Fruit, Flower, Vegetable Growers Association, and if you're into gardening or farming here, um, they ha show they talk about everything that they planted, how well they did, what they different things they use for fertilizer. It's um, it's it's a long um, book and it's actually very detailed, so it's kind of interesting. Um, there's things about Greer's about uh, the Faroe Yacht Club, the um, kudzu, um, satsumas, uh, pecans, the sawmill, uh, the women's clubs, uh, the water supply, all kinds of interesting things. And if you go in and um, just research, put in Fairhope Colony, comma, any of those things, and many, many, many more, lots of interesting things to find. Um, but we also have the papers of many of the very interesting women who lived here. Um, <coughs> Marie uh, Howland, um, who's pictured there, she, Fairhope was actually the third uh, utopian community that she lived in. She came here from Topolobampo, and prior to that, she lived in a utopian community in France, which I can't pronounce, Catherine, Famille Stera. But the Fourier was the, well, whatever. Um, and uh, she was Fairhope's first librarian and actually Alabama's first librarian, and uh, because Fairhope had the first library in Alabama. Um, there was something interesting. Oh, and another aside is um, after her first uh, commune that she lived in, she wrote a book um, a long time ago, let's see, uh, in 1879 called Papa's Own Girl. And in her book, uh, the, the it, the main character was a um, single successful businesswoman, which apparently was just scandalous at the time, but um, it became a big bestseller and everybody read it and it, it, it again, a very influential book. Um, and I also, in addition to being the librarian, she was also the associate editor of the Fairhope Courier, um, which E.B. Gaston was the editor of, and she, um, she had also been the editor of the newspaper at Topolobampo Bay. So she was an interesting. Lydia Jane Newcomb um, Cummings, very interesting woman, very, very interesting in physical education. Um, she was involved in getting the organic school started. She co-wrote a book with her husband um, called Industrial and Vocational Education, which was all about basically getting movement into education. She was a very forward-thinking woman. She ran all the women's clubs, which are very interesting. We have all the yearbooks that you can go to online. You can see the different kinds of things they discussed. You can see what what, what flowers they ha had on their tables, what kind of cookies they served, who played what on the piano. I mean, they're very, very um, in-depth, and I thought they were interesting to read. Um, Clara Atkinson was um, E.B. Gaston's stepsister. She was a suffragette. She was a physician. Um, she is the woman who um, Atkinson Lane was named for. Uh, Marietta Pierce Johnson um, started the organic school. Um, she, um, John Dewey came here in 1915 to look at the school and he wrote a very, who was an educational reformer, he wrote a very positive review of the school. Um, which caused a lot of people, interesting people to move here and interested to know about that school. Um, and she also wrote a book called um, Youth in a World of Men, um, published in 1829, or 1929, pardon me, and um, kind of outlining her, her um, views on education. And then uh, Anne Belangie Cole, we have many, many, many papers of hers. She was very, very interested. She was a diehard uh, Georgist and diehard fan of single taxation. And her letters are very interesting, especially if you're interested in sort of the colony. She, she 
she was very um, interested in sticking to the Constitution and sticking to the concepts of of Henry George, and you know there was a lot of discussion about all of that. So, um, also a lot of interesting reformers of the time. There's Joseph Fells who gave uh, a lot of money to Fairhope, as well as all over Europe, and um, he um, he was a, he was a wealthy soap manufacturer who was a, again a diehard single tax and Henry George fan. Here's Henry George in the middle, and Fisk Warren was another. Um, reformer at the time. He was also happened to be the U.S. Um, tennis champ of uh, 1893. Um, but he was, there were lots of letters from him and he gave a lot, lots of advice to the people here about what he thought people should do. Upton Sinclair came here. We have a few letters of his. Um, you all probably know he wrote the book The Jungle, which, um, which um, talked about the meatpacking industry and exposed sort of labor inequities there, and um, that book led to the uh, Food and Drug Administration. And um, finally, Booker T. Washington, we have a few letters from him. Um, mostly, um, I think people, some people were trying to get him to come to Fairhope, and he wrote some letters to E.B. Gaston, and um, again, very interesting. Among many others, these are again just a sampling. And then finally, um, the, the, the more modern or contemporary pair of papers of the Fairhope Single Tax Corporation, which was the Industrial so Association morphed into in 1903. You can read about the transfer of the parklands to the city, the transfer of the library. You can read about education, about the committees if you happen to be a committee member at the Fairhope Single Tax Corporation. It's interesting to read its history. You can read about the Arts and Crafts Festival. Um, I could go on and on. There's really a lot of interesting stuff of all different types um, in our collection, and I really hope that you'll all be interested to check it out. And with that, I'm going to introduce Catherine King, who's going to show you how to find anything you're interested to know. <laughs> I'm Catherine King, and I'm so pleased to be here this evening and enjoyed very much working on the project and want to make sure you know that Libby McCauley, along with Savannah and Allison and Teen Senor, I don't know if Teen's here or not, but Libby, hello Teen, uh, we, we all were involved in the cataloging and certainly enjoyed working with all these ladies very much. What I'm going to do is show you briefly how to get around the site. It's really quite easy. How many have, have looked at the site before? Okay, very good. Well, here it is the archives, and we tell you that it is encompasses from about 1890 until 1997, and there are over 80,000 images. Now, we didn't read every single page, but boy, we read a lot of the pages, and we cataloged many, many of them. But we'd like you to just, when you're looking at it, just go, go through quickly and read. But we do have, let me find my little cursor here. We do have a couple of static um, lists that it's very helpful for a first time user to go into these two lists. One is of people. These are all the people who are cataloged. Some are, are, have, are just have one entry, but boy, we put them in. So there's name after name after name after name of these people. So it's helpful to look at all the individuals who are listed in the archives because you can search by people. And you can also search by search term. And here are all the different search terms. And it's helpful, again, when you're first getting on the site, it's helpful if you'll go through the search terms just to get a feel for how things are cataloged. For example, we specifically decided that it would be a good idea to, to use the eras of Fairhope history. So you'll see Fairhope Colony, and then you'll see, let me get down here and show you. 
See, here, here are all the Fairhope Colony entries. You'll see Fairhope Colony, comma, something, like Fairhope Colony, uh, comma, bank, or beautification. Then we flip on over, and we're going to get to the Fairhope Industrial Association era, which was 1894 to 1904. In 1904, the Iowa Charter ran out on the Fairhope Industrial Association, and so it was chartered in Alabama as the Fairhope Single Tax Corporation. And there you see Fairhope Single Tax Corporation entry. So you'll see FSTC, comma, something, and you can search uh, that way. And then there's Town of Fairhope, City of Fairhope, but many, 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 many other entries. So for the first time user, it's helpful to go into those static lists. These are not searchable lists, but never fear, you will be able to search. We also want you to know that you can access it from any of your devices, anywhere in the world. Savan, who is monitoring our requests, recently got a request from someone in the UK just this past week. So wherever you are, you can access the archives. However, if you live in Fairhope, probably the, the best thing to do is to come into the library. Uh, Fairhope Single Tax has purchased the equipment. Uh, it's right inside the periodical room, and it's two large monitors. On one monitor, you can do your Fairhope Single Tax searching, like we're on right now, and on the other monitor, you actually will able, be able to go into the archives and see these things very, very clearly. So you can make them bigger. When we were doing our cataloging, it took about 15 months. When we were doing our cataloging, you know, I, I could blow up that word so I could really see it. And you'll be able to do the same thing if you come into the library. Now your tablet or your, your home computer, if you have a, a touch screen monitor, you'll be able to do the same thing. But this is really um, a, a, a good choice to come into the library. You can also print from here in the library. So that's one way to access it. You can also go into the system and request that an image be released to you, and it will, we will, uh, you are, are able to do that. Let's go to the search function. There are two ways to search. You can search by name or term, or you can search just, just by, by search. I need two hands here. <laughs> I'm going to search nude. <laughs> you know, we have a history of nude in Fairhope. Oh, <gasps> what do we get? Hmm. This, what's this is what comes up when you get a search. This just happens to be one entry. Sometimes you get thousands of entries. But this just happens to be one entry. I kind of knew what we were going to get. And what you see on the right is what the cataloger put in. The cataloger went in and read these images. And of course, you can't see it on the screen right now. It's too far away. But when you're at your home computer or when, if you're over in the uh, periodical room here at the library, you'll be able to, uh, to read it. But just so you know, to pique your interest, uh, down at the bottom, this is, these are meeting minutes from 1896, May of 1896, so the colony uh, had been established about 18 months ago. And um, the council moved and carried that no nude bathing would be allowed on Fairhope Industrial Association beaches. Now I guess it could go on someplace else, maybe down uh, in Nicholsville, but uh, certainly not on FIA Association beaches. So there's lots of interesting things in these meeting minutes, but that's how you would search by word. And if you saw what I did, I went in and I put a quote Oh, let me do this. This is interesting. And then I'm going to put a word or a phrase. And I ended with a quote. 
So it's going to search the archives for the Ku Klux Klan. Let's see what we get. Oh, we got some things. Hmm. Let's see. Here's a newspaper article. That was a letter to the editor written to the Mobile paper by the single tax colony president at the time, who was William Call, who was James Belange's son-in-law. And he said, there's not going to be any Ku Klux Klan parade on single tax land. Let's go back and see what the other entries said. See, aren't these interesting? Somewhere in there, the Ku Klux Klan, yeah, using Knoll Park for the parade. Uh, they decided they, they did not want to use colony land for the Ku Klux Klan parade. This was in 1925 or so, I think. So that's how you search with the search button. But you see there's also another search button, and that's by where you can search by name or by search term. And we've already looked at that long roster of names, and we've already looked at the long roster of search terms. Well, here you can search by people, and there's the alphabet. So if you want to search G, and let's go down to Corny Gaston, and we have many, many different searches for Corny Gaston. Now, you will also see here this is a letter, and you'll see the letter right there. It's a typewritten letter. But you'll see this first result there, 1.16, 1 through uh, 95. We catalogers decided we were not going to uh, catalog every single page. The 95 pages, that we decided, in our opinion, that did not t every single page did not t need to be cataloged. So we batched it. And when we batch something, It'll be that circle, and you click to have the information, and you just have to read through those 95 pages. And it's coming. Almost to the end. There we go. So see, these, this is that batch. And so if you're interested in what is in this particular batch and you have the description of the information, then you can read through each of the pages. And if you want copies, then you can request the copies. Okay. Now I'd like Allison to come up. She's going to, what, what I have done is, we have so many fascinating letters, and um, now this is, you yes, I have and so what I did was I, I selected some letters, and uh, I think you'll find them really interesting. Some are funny, some are poignant, some are just crazy, and uh, I thought you'd like to look through them with us and see the types of things that are, that are in the archives. Very frankly, I was choosing them, so I chose the ones that were of interest to me, which tend to be the earlier ones. I, I have to tell you that the archives, to me, were more interesting from a historical perspective, the earlier ones. And by the time the mid-1930s hit, uh, the corporation archives, a lot of those things were just, um, oh, telephone bills and, and transfer of deeds and things like that, which didn't pique our interest too much. We batched uh, quite a few of those. Most of these early papers are letters to E.B. Gaston. We don't have many letters from him, but because the letters are so descriptive and people were really quite elegant in the way they wrote uh, and, and really said what they need, need, meant to say in those early days, we can kind of sense what E.B., as we called him, uh, was, was meaning to say. And so, um, again, most of the early letters are to Mr. Gaston. But one thing that we did find, of course, it was really interesting to read these old letters because people were uh, very mannerly, very courtly. 
Uh, you had people uh, mainly using their first initials, like EB or LH. You, you would know what their real names were, but they, they used their initials, Mr. E.B. Gastern or Mr. C.L. Coleman. If you were a confidant of Mr. Gaston, he, uh, the letter to him would probably say, Dear Gaston. So that means that he's probably your buddy. Or Dear Brother Gaston. If they were uh, brothers in the populist reform movement, he might say, Dear Brother Gaston. Um, something that I found really, really funny was they were, again, they were very mannerly, but they did disagree with one another in some of these, uh, in some of these letters. And they would say, I am not in sympathy with you. Well, if, if they're not in sympathy with you, that's really bad. <laughs> so so it's, it's been fun to, to listen to how the people of the late 19th century really spoke. Okay, this first um, sample is, which one is this? From women it's in. Mm-hmm, okay. Go back to the, click, close that, and then. Just the, you want the. No, I, I want the, yeah, okay. This is an early letter. And you, when, you, when you click in, you see what our just catalog description was. This is just a sample of the early letters that were sent about the National Cooperative Company. This was the, uh, the company, the, the colony that E.B. Gaston wanted to start in Lake Charles, Louisiana. It failed, but he worked really hard to get it going. So these are early letters uh, dated around 1890. And this is very typical. This letter is talking about the Bellamy plan. This lady is interested in uh, knowing more about. So this is one of the many, many letters of inquiry. You can go to the next one, Allison. All right. All right. This next one is another letter of inquiry about the National Cooperative Company, again, which failed. And during that time period, the 1890 time period, there's not a word about single tax. E.B. Gaston was not interested in single tax. He didn't know anything about single tax at that period. So he wanted to start this cooperative colony in Lake Charles. And this is another letter of inquiry from somebody in Florida who had also had some dealings with the Topolobampo uh, colony in uh, Mexico. And uh, this fellow who was writing E.B. said, don't go to, go to Louisiana, come over to Florida. If you come over to Florida, I'll invest some money. Go and he wrote one. many letters, I remember. And he wrote story. many letters, yeah. It's a nice thing about the archives is that if you, if you move around, uh, around those object numbers that we're punching in, and you will find those, um, that very often there may be a series of letters from these individuals. So it's nice to know that. Here's another uh, letter that was uh, in November of 1890. Um, and this is, was from a Canadian. So they were reading about this cooperative experience that was going to happen in Louisiana, but that didn't happen. OK, the next one is, again, another 1890 letter. And this is from another lady who had uh, read Edward Bellamy's Looking Backward. And she wrote E.B. Gaston wanting to know about what was happening, send materials, send the contract, send the Constitution, how much does it cost, and here's a postage stamp. You'll see a lot of these letters that people will include a return postage stamp because things were very, very dear. There were many uh, economic ups and downs in the latter part of the 19th century, and money was very dear. And it, I'm just noticing here it says that Jesse James Oh, yeah, this is the one about Jesse James. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Is this the Jesse James robbed him of everything? Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. I, I had skipped one. Yeah, this is so funny. Well, sad, but in 1873, this poor man was robbed by Jesse James, and everything that he owned was taken, and he still hadn't recovered, but he does want to come to the colony. He's very poor, but he will work hard. So you, you see this a lot. There are a lot of letters like this where people are in despair. They don't have any money. They can't find any work. 
Can they come to the colony? Can they pay their membership fee somehow by working? What yeah, uh, this is to, this letter is to Alf Wooster. Alf Wooster was one of the original uh, single tax club Des Moines uh, contingent. Alf Wooster uh, was the publisher of the Liberty Bell newspaper, and uh, he is. This is a letter to Alf from this gentleman who had a horrible experience in Mexico at Topolobampo, horrible experience, and he's interested to know how the Fairhope uh, colony is going to turn out. This is 1894, so between 1890 and 1894, E.B. Gaston had dropped the Lake Charles plan. He picked up the single tax idea, some say from James Belangie, but he, he used that then as a vehicle to promote his cooperative colony. And uh, so that, that was interesting about, uh, uh, about that. Yeah, this is another example of the poor people who want to be involved in the colony. <clears throat> you want me to move they on? They have no money. Yeah, you can move on. And I'm going, we're, we're not going to the letter itself because you can't see it on the screen, but that's something that you will be doing when you, you access the archives. This, I'm telling you a little bit about newspapers. The archives has, has, there are many, many references to newspapers in the archives because newspapers were how people found out about things. There were, there were rags all over the country. There were little pop-up newspapers, but people were reading newspapers. One of the major newspapers of the day was The Public, and it was published, it started publication in the late 1890s, and it was published by Lewis Post. Post eventually became uh, Under Secretary of Labor to Woodrow Wilson, but he was a big single taxer. He wrote E.B. Gaston in 1898 saying, do you want to advertise the Courier in the, advertise the Fairhope Courier newspaper in the public? And so E.B. Gaston, always looking for a way to promote the colony, always needing money, always needing donations, he said he established a relationship with Lewis Post. So that's the public. It was a very powerful single tax uh, newspaper out of Chicago. The next entry is the 1125, yeah, okay. This letter is very interesting. It was, it was written in uh, 1908, and here we start seeing some of the letters from Joseph Fells. Now, Joseph Fells had been in touch with E.B. Gaston in the late uh, 1890s. He had read about the Fairhope Colony. Fells was a big single taxer, both in the United States and in Great Britain and, and in Denmark also. Um, but this letter, in this letter, uh, Fells and Post have disagreements about Fairhope. Post will not publish anything about Fairhope in the public newspaper because he says there's just too much reaction to it, too much reaction. I have to publish the other side all the time when I do anything about Fairhope. And Fells writes and really, really uh, is not happy with Post about this. And Fells is a very powerful person. Fells says, well, I might just pull out my support for some of your projects if you don't do what, what I ask you to do. Okay, this is a, le a letter from a local, Mr. E.Q. Norton. Mr. Norton was an interesting person. He um, was the Alabama representative for the National Single Tax League. He lived in Daphne. And uh, in this letter, he and James Belangi have been really at each other's throats and there are a series of kind of nasty letters between them because Norton has written against the Fairhope Colony to the, to the National Single Tax League magazine, and uh, Belangie is, of course, and, and trying. And Norton was the editor of the Daphne Standard. Yeah, and Norton was the editor of the Daphne Standard paper, and so there was this back and forth between both the courier, E.B. Gaston, and uh, and E.Q. Norton, but as well as Belangie, because Belangie was usually 90% of the time he was really behind whatever Gaston was trying to do. Now we're going to 
But this is, EQ, this is E.Q. Norton, Ed Norton earlier. Ed Norton, again, was the Alabama representative for the National uh, Single Tax League. And in this letter, he's writing uh, Gaston, and it's 1894, May of 1894, and he's saying, we're thrilled that your locating committee is going to be coming down here. I will be your host. And that's when Mr. Belange and uh, Allison's great, 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 great grandfather, Mr. Mann, uh, they were doing their locating committee work, and they had been all the way over to Texas and Arkansas, and they were looking for a spot to establish the colony. And Mr. Norton at that time said, I'm your host, I'll show you great land, happy to help you. And sure enough, he did in uh, June of that year when they came through the area. And he was also the first person they saw on the Eastern Shore when the landing party came in on November 15, 1894 and took the James Carney Bay boat from Mobile over to the Eastern Shore. They didn't go to Battles Wharf initially. They stopped at the Daphne uh, Wharf and Mr. Norton greeted them there. And then they went on to Battles Wharf. So Mr. Norton kind of changed his stripes a little bit. This is, okay. This is an interesting period in Fairhope's history. Uh, this is 1906, but in 1904, the, um, the, Mr. Gaston realized and the leaders of the colony realized, we've got to have some more houses in town. We've, we've got to get houses. And we need, we have people coming in, but we need housing. And so what they did is they formed the Fairhope Improvement Company. And um, Mr. Joseph Fells was the major stockholder in this company. He put in a lot of money, I think some, something like 25000 or something like that uh, in the company. But Mr. Frank Brown, a local person, and uh, Mr. Fells and uh, Bolton Hall, who was a big single taxer nationally, George Bancroft, a local single taxer, and Mr. R.F. Powell. Mr. R.F. Powell had been affiliated with Mr. Fells. Mr. Powell was from Philadelphia, and he had been in charge of the vacant lots program in Philadelphia, which was very, very successful, really all over the country, but the one in Philadelphia was very successful, where, again, people didn't have food to eat, they, in the, especially in the cities, and so any land that was not being used in the cities um, the vacant lot programs tried to, uh, to get the land free and let people use it to, to farm and, and grow vegetables. And some, some people sold them, some people just used them to feed their families. They were called potato patches uh, across the country. But anyway, Mr. Powell was very successful with the vacant lots program. And Mr. Fells encouraged him to come down to Fairhope and, and live here and start the Fairhope Improvement Company. And the Fairhope Improvement Company did build quite a few houses in town, and they were also involved in, um, in working in some, with some of the, um, one of the, the bay boats. The, I think it was the second bay boat that they were involved with. So the Improvement Company was not affiliated with the Fairhope Colony because the colony could not go into debt. And so this was, uh, an unrelated business, it was really kind of related, but um, they did have money coming in from the outside, from Mr. Fells. Okay. So we're going to 10, 14, yeah. All righty. Not only did we need houses, but the colony needed land. When the, the first uh, single taxers came, you know, they were only able to buy a really small amount of land they were cash poor. And so through several people, including Allison's relatives, uh, Mr. Fells helped, but there was a, a, a gentleman, two gentlemen in Chicago with the Chicago Single Tax Club, uh, Mr. Louis Bostetto and Mr. Nussbaum. I've never, know, never knew what Mr. Nussbaum's first name was, but both of them agreed to buy 160 acres of property. So that was 320 acres of property that they agreed to buy and they would hold until the uh, Fairhope Industrial Association had the money to buy the property from, with, which they did in, within about three years. But um, that, that tells you 
that the, the colony was struggling. They, they needed population, they needed places for people to, to live, and they needed land. Let's see. This is 436. Well, this letter's great. <laughs> This is early, this is 1897, and these are one of those letters that just jump off the page. This is, Miss, this is Howard Leach, and Howard must have been a really enthusiastic guy. Howard was the brother-in-law of Frank L. Brown, fantastic Frank Brown, and we know about Mr. Brown because he started our sawmill and uh, Clay City, and he just could do anything. Mr. Brown was wonderful. Uh, but uh, Mr. Leach really had a lot of correspondence with Mr. Gaston. Mr. Brown didn't write so much, but Mr. Bra Mr. Leach's letters uh, kind of pop off the page. Here he says he's straining every nerve to get to Fairhope. And the next one... I'm sorry, I forget to put it in the thing. There's several like this that are really fun to read. This one uh, is, this is spring of 1897, and he says something like, uh, he's reporting on, on the progress about coming to Fairhope to start the sawmill and maybe a cotton gin. And he, um, he and Mr. Brown are looking forward to coming. Mr. Brown had very poor health. He was a jeweler. And so uh, Mr. Brown has sold his store and his fixtures. And Mr. Leach was a portrait artist and he sold all his equipment in his store. And uh, he says, he wants to come and shake your paw in person. <laughs> and uh, he said, he, uh, he said, told Mr. Gatchin to tell the boys there that they're coming with the best sawmill outfit that's ever sawed lumber, and we're going there for business. And they did. <laughs> and in another letter, he, he said, would, Mr. Gaston, would you please tell uh, Captain Lawrence that we need a flat, a flat uh, boat so that we can get this equipment that was coming down from Atlanta to, uh, to get this sawmill underway. One of the letters, uh, Howard Leach signed let's see, hustlingly yours. He was hustling. <laughs> All right, this letter is, this is, um, this is the Lawrence family, and many of you know the Lawrence family, a prominent family in town. This is old Silas Lawrence, and his letter, I mean, you, you just have to read it and, and look at his, his uh, handwriting. But he was born in Maine, but he, he lived in Central Baldwin, somewhere around Silver, Silver Hill or something. He moved here as a younger man. And he joined the Confederate um, uh, Army during the war. And uh, he ended up in Florida, and he became a minister, and he uh, was a boat builder. And he said, you know, I sure would like to come to Fairhope. I just really, really would, but I can't. I'm so poor. I'm just, the letter is very, very humble, but eventually he did. He and his son, Captain Lawrence, and Captain Lawrence was instrumental in, in, with the, the first bay boat and, and piloted it, and this is the family that got approval to put tents down at the beach to live until they could get their house built. So old Silas was there to uh, living on the beach until the house got built, and they, they helped build the first bay boat. Let's see. Oh, this is a fun letter. This letter is to E.B. Gaston from his half-sister, Clara Atkinson. E.B. Uh, had 11 brothers and sisters, and some were half-siblings. He was the youngest of, of the group. And this sister, Clara, was a medical doctor, and she moved to Fairhope pretty soon after uh, E.B. and his family came. He, she did not formally practice medicine in Fairhope, but she did, kind of. She took care of people in her home and certainly consulted. But um, 
here she is back in Des Moines. She still has lots of friends in Des Moines and she's sick and you know she hasn't had an onion poultice and that's that's helping. But what is so funny is what she says here. She says, I am not sorry that I have title to some ground. In other words, she's not leasing land from the colony. I'm not sorry that I have title to some ground, but will always regret that I bought land so near Fairhope. So she was a crotchety lady, and she really was not anywhere near where E.B. was on the single tax issue. But um, it's kind of a fun, uh, funny letter. Uh, this next letter is from James Belange, and it's written very early. This is December the 12th, 1894. Now, they had just hit town. They had just, I mean, they just hit the shore less than a month ago, and James Belange is on E.B. E.B., I have not heard from you. Where are you? What is wrong with you? Well, the man is busy. His family is down at the Battles Hotel. He and the, the men are at a log cabin in the woods getting bitten by fleas at night. They're taking the wagon into this area every day, which is not an easy trip. He's working hard, but um, Mr. Belange is on him, and Mr. Belange is trying to get the scrip, the colony money. He's trying to get the scrip printed. And so he's got the plates, and E.B. won't respond, and so on and so forth. So that's kind of a, a funny thing. And we do have some of the plates in the Fairhope Museum of the early colony script, as well as the, uh, the uh, war, wharf certificates, too. And this, oh yeah, <laughs> this is so funny. We had a cigar maker in town, Mr. A.J. Cullen, who, by the way, he had the uh, first little girl born in the colony, and it was suggested, the executive council of the Fairhope Industrial Association suggested that her name should be Fairhope. So sure enough, her name is Helen Fairhope Cullen. I think Wilson Dunning, I can't remember her last name, but anyway, uh, her middle name was Fairhope. But the cigar maker uh, paid his membership fees to the colony in cigars. <laughs> I assume he got his tobacco from over in the Somerdale area. Um, but anyway, here's a letter from E.B. and he needed to go to the dentist and he didn't have any money and the dentist is saying he would be more than happy to, to take payment in cigars. <laughs> so there are all these little humorous things. Just a few more and then you all can ask us some questions. This is, this is Marie. We couldn't, we couldn't have a talk about the archives and it be in the library without talking a little bit more about Marie Hallam. She was 63 when she hit town. This is March 1899 when she came to Fairhope. E.B. Gaston had been promoting her as coming because they had been corresponding for about six months. And he, uh, E.B. told Joseph Fells that Mrs. Hallam was coming to town and that she had this fantastic library of 2,000 books. And wasn't that wonderful? And so here Marie is. This is April. She doesn't be here a month. April of 1899, and she wrote Mr. Fells herself. And she said, hello, Mr. Fells. Mr. Gaston, our wonderful secretary, is a wrong. Um, that our collection is only about 1,000 or 1,100 books, something like that. And uh, we do need a public library, and she talks about the collection, and she talks about her dear, beloved, late husband, Edward, who died in Mexico at Topolobampo, and that he was a, a bibliophile, and so on and so forth. And so she asked Mr. Um, Fells if he would look over the catalog. She sent him the catalog, the listing of books in the collection, so he could be impressed. And he sent it back to her, and I think that they, uh, uh, initially he gave $50 for shelves. So the next year, April 18th, I think, of 1900, the library opened in a room in her house, in Marie's house. Here is Marie's uh, copy of her membership certificate in the Fairhope Industrial Association. She, was, she didn't have a lot of money, so she didn't, wasn't able to pay her membership fee right away. So it's dated a little bit later, I think maybe 1903 or something. Alrighty, this is the last one I have for you tonight. <laughs> um, 
It's kind of sad. Uh, E.B. Gaston died in 1937, and Frank Brown, who, who came to town in 1897, he died not too long afterwards. They were both born the same year. They were born the, at the start of the Civil War. And uh, here Frank is writing E.B. Gaston. It's 1936, and E.B. has decided to not run for secretary of the Ferrup Single Tax Corporation again. He put his son, Cornelius, the chiropractor, in to, to, take, over his, uh, to take over his job. So in this, uh, Frank says, you know, I think Corny's gonna do a good job with your guidance along the way. But he also said something like um, that, let's see, that he can't do very much anymore because he's old, but he said he will continue to work for the single tax as he is able. So <laughs> uh, that's, that's 36, and again, E.B. Gaston would die in 37. Uh, E.B. and E.B.'s wife died in 34. Marietta Johnson will die, I think, in 38. So that first layer of of uh, early people were, were passing away. So this is our wonderful archives. And again, it goes from around 1890, you saw those early, early papers, to 1997. And I just showed you the early stuff because that's what we're interested in. But those are little tidbits. It's easy to search. It's easy to find interesting information uh, within the archives. And I, I certainly hope that you will access it and that you will tell your friends. We hope that students will use it. It would be a great tool, a great way for uh, young people to learn how to do research. We have and, the Fairhope uh, uh, High School librarian. Oh, we do? Oh, good, good, good. Wonderful. Represented to them. Yeah. And so it's, it's um, Fairhope Single Tax. If you want to pick up the dot uh, com, mm -hmm. if you want to pick up the yeah uh, ad web address, there's a flyer on the back which gives it. 